When Phoenix firefighters pulled up, they had to figure out how they were going to fight a fire they could barely get to. In their way, thousands of pieces of equipment, materials, and junk all heaped higher than the tallest rescuer. Basically, the entire yard area is just full of stuff. There's one small path to the trailer. Inside the trailer is the same way, just full of belongings. Firefighters tell me there seems to have been a hoarding situation inside the house. Neighbors say there were boxes and debris piled up to the ceiling. And fire crews tell me this is their third hoarder fire in Tempe in just the past six months. Firefighters got out of this one alive, but not without injury. A captain was taken to the burn unit with burns to his face, hands, and ear. Another hurt his knee. I wouldn't want to be them. We'll put it that way. Did you guys? The one, the one had his head damaged pretty bad. I think. Hoarding has recently gained a lot of attention through reality programs on television. Widely considered to be a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, hoarding is estimated to affect roughly 3 million Americans. While it is natural for everyone to hoard to a certain degree, chronic hoarders do so to the point where it greatly affects their living conditions. In the worst cases, possessions, trash, or other objects are stacked or piled over nearly every square foot of the home, in some cases from the floor to the ceiling. This invites other serious consequences, as insects, small animals, and microorganisms find this environment favorable to live in as well. Firefighters are very likely to respond to homes of hoarders in both a medical and firefighting capacity. It is important that we recognize the unique challenges and dangers that such conditions pose to us. During the early part of 2012, the Tempe Fire Department set up hoarding conditions at their training facility and conducted multi-company training challenging crews to perform search and rescue operations in low visibility, high clutter conditions. Seeing the opportunity to do the same, Avondale Fire Rescue worked with Goodyear and Tolleson Fire Departments to set up similar conditions at the Avondale Goodyear Fire Training Center in Avondale, Arizona. This video will discuss the challenges hoarding conditions pose to firefighters, tactical and safety considerations, and fire prevention measures that may help alert responding fire departments as to the conditions that can be expected at the residence of a hoarder so appropriate strategic and tactical considerations can be made. In an effort to simulate hoarder conditions, furniture, clothing, electronics, and miscellaneous household items were collected using generous donations from the local Goodwill, shelters, as well as the City of Avondale's bulk trash pickup program. Besides compromising access, egress, and maneuverability within the training building, these contents would have greatly added to the fuel load of any live fire that would have been used. Therefore, for safety reasons, it was decided that fire conditions would be simulated using four fog machines to simulate smoke and limit visibility. A red light was also set up on the interior to simulate the fire. Crews were instructed to clear fire control once the red light was located. When fire control was achieved, the foggers were turned off. Being that no live fire would be utilized during the drills, certain regulations provided in NFPA 1403 did not have to be followed. Mainly, exits could be locked or blocked and no pre-drill walkthrough would be required. This added an element of surprise and unknown to what is a familiar floor plan and layout in well-utilized fire department fire training buildings. Moreover, it permitted the use of window bar props over existing windows, thus reinforcing the importance of having crews soften up the building and aggressively seek alternative means of access and egress during firefighting operations. Safety officers were placed on both the exterior and interior as well as the third floor where ladder companies would be cutting through a barred window prop and rescuing a victim that had been signaling for help upon arrival of the first crew. Safety officers were equipped with video cameras and thermal imaging cameras for documentation, safety, and training purposes. Uh, command is here. 
The Horner House fire drills turned out to be highly valuable in identifying the new challenges in rescuing victims, maintaining firefighter safety, and fighting fire under dangerous hoarding conditions. The drills also serve to reinforce the importance of the current best practices that fire departments use in day-to-day -day structure fires. Hoarding conditions are very obvious on the interior of a residence. However, the exterior may or may not provide firefighters with an advance warning of the challenges that await them. Some hoarders are ashamed of the conditions they live in and do not want others to know about it out of fear that their lifestyle choices will be taken away from them. They understand that the homeowners associations or local codes may bring some form of enforcement to their doors. It is for these reasons that the exterior may appear to be relatively normal. Other hoarders may not be as worried about code enforcement and the conditions on the exterior are more representative on what's on the inside. Firefighters approaching a structure fire should size up the environment appropriately. Derelict vehicles, vehicles themselves with hoarding conditions on the interior, and clutter adjacent to and around the structure or on porches are all signs that hoarding conditions may exist on the interior as well. Crews should take note of the debris or other items visible through windows. If time permits during the response, our MCTs might also help in making an effective size up by utilizing the aerial view function. Often hoarding conditions on the exterior can be seen in aerial photographs provided that the present conditions existed at the time of the photograph. Once the size up or observations on the interior of the structure indicate that a hoarding situation is present, it is essential to clearly communicate that information to command and other assigned units. Crews should use the term hoarding conditions to describe what they see. The term hoarding conditions will paint a more complete picture than using other terms like debris or clutter. It prompts all personnel to anticipate difficult access and egress as well as better defines the risk management profile that is to be considered throughout the incident. It also prompts the incident commander to consider requesting additional resources since fires in hoarder houses tend to be labor intensive. Due to the nature of structure fires where hoarding conditions exist, it is extremely important that extra consideration be given to the risk management profile in which we make our tactical decisions. As much information as possible needs to be obtained on the structure, its conditions, and the fire's location and progress. If we approach fighting fires in a hoarder's house in the same manner we would under normal conditions, we will inevitably find ourselves several steps behind in our attack. It is important to factor into the overall strategy that assignments will take longer to be accomplished than under normal fighting conditions. Advancing hose line into the hoarder's structure fire will be extremely time consuming and labor, labor intensive. Heavy fuel loads and hazardous substances may increase the likelihood of extreme fire conditions in shorter amounts of time. Debris will undoubtedly fall onto hose lines, increasing the likelihood of firefighters becoming lost or separated from their crew. Enormous piles of debris may conceal deep seated fires requiring long and extensive overhaul and walking upright and unimpeded within the structure will simply not be possible. Every responder from the fire to the incident commander needs to reconsider what would constitute an offensive attack under such conditions and address the risk management profile accordingly. This places an added emphasis on effective communication. The excessive quantity of personal possessions in a hoarder's house will undoubtedly be the greatest challenge our crews face. When and where practical, crews should make an effort to ensure that paths into and out of the house remain open by removing or securing objects. This will require command to re consider requesting additional resources of manpower early on in the incident. Where possible, crews should try to remove objects to the exterior. During our exercises, it was found that removing larger objects to the exterior and placing them away from the structure in a somewhat organized fashion aided in allowing crews to expedite searches, extricate any trapped victims, and advance hose lines into the structure. 
A considerable amount of debris may eventually be removed in efforts to keep pathways open and hose lines from being covered up. This exterior debris pile can potentially become quite large, so it's best if it's located away from the structure. One important note is to ensure that removed objects are not placed in front of other possible routes of ingress or egress. This is, there is a good possibility that any or all windows or doors might be used during firefighting operations. Attacking a fire in a hoarder's house will undoubtedly require more attention to detail for all personnel operating on the fire ground, especially in regards to the assignments made by the incident commander. Instead of having crews pull additional lines off of an apparatus to assist with the interior fire attack, it might be more efficient to use the additional manpower to assist with the management of hand lines already on the interior. Our drills found that placing a second crew and hose line on top of the first sometimes added to the congestion and it inhibited the maneuverability of both crews. When two companies were assigned to work together on one hand line, they seemed to be more efficient in removing debris or obstacles, maneuvering those hand lines, and removing potential victims. The IC should be aggressive in maintaining a tactical reserve of resources. Ladder companies are likely to be very busy as they soften up the structure, address ventilation, and create new places of access or egress for interior crews. For this reason, it may be prudent to have both a ladder company and an engine company on deck for quick assignment, as well as additional units staged to replace them. When additional chief officers are available, they should be assigned to forward operating positions within sectors in order to help maintain better accountability and safety, since company officers may be more involved in the demanding physical work of the hoarder environment. From a company officer standpoint, companies on hand lines need to be properly spaced out for efficient hose line management, yet still in visual verbal, or tactile contact. The movement within the structure will be severely compromised, so all crews must maintain vigilant focus on air management. IDLH atmospheres must be exited well before the low air warning on SCBA's sound. Search and rescue operations in the hoarder environment promise to be extra challenging. The tick will be the most valuable tool to use when visibility is compromised and should be used at the front of the hose line whenever possible. A primary all clear may not ever be possible given the conditions, but firefighters should still make an effort to reach out over and under objects. Crew continuity is essential with extra effort spent on staying on the hose line, maintaining visual, vocal, and tactile contact with other crew members. Right and left-handed searches on the walls may not ever be possible with only stacks of debris delineating the pathways inside the house. This debris is highly likely to fall into hoses, thus placing an added emphasis on maintaining contact with the hose line in order not to get lost or disoriented. Having additional personnel spread out along the hose line may not only be beneficial for maneuvering the hose, but may also serve well in maintaining our contact with it when it does get buried. When fire personnel find a victim, they should consider alternative means of removing them from the structure besides the path they took through the interior. An effective size up and softening of the structure may reveal that nearby windows and doors offer a shorter, clearer exit. During the exercises, some crews chose to exit the same way they came in simply because of habit. Nearby doors and windows, which could have facilitated extrication, were left untried. Dragging victims over debris and obstacles may be very time consuming and demanding on resources. Forcing open windows and doors may offer a better alternative. Ladder companies should always be available to breach walls or create their own entrance into the structure if necessary. In the worst cases, hoarders use every spare cubic foot of their home for storage, leaving distinct, narrow pathways to only the most essential locations inside. These pathways will usually lead to the bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, TV, and an exit. Expect them to be lined with very tall, heavy piles of debris with little or no stability, threatening to be a collapse hazard, either bearing personnel or hose lines. Excessive debris on the exterior may increase the likelihood of fire extension into adjacent exposures. Therefore, it is important that command obtain a 360 degree size up as soon as possible in order to identify these exposures.
As stated, every spare cubic foot of available volume may be utilized, including garages and attic spaces. Lightweight wood trusses engineered strictly for roof loads may be stressed beyond design by heavy items stored within them. Add water to that load and an impending structural collapse may come quickly, even without any fire impingement. Ladder companies who observe hoarding conditions in the attic space after cutting ventilation holes should immediately sound emergency traffic to alert command and all crews operating on the fire ground that additional loads are in the roof system. It is important to note that fire crews may likely enter hoarder houses during other calls for service besides structure fires. These citizens may call 911 for medical reasons as well. Personal protective equipment including masks, gloves, long pants, trauma sleeves, and eye protection should be donned at all times for medical and other service calls. Personnel should be fully aware that the health risks that may be exposed to may include poison insects, bed bugs, biohazards, medical waste, rodents, dead animals, and other various infectious diseases. One hoarding house in Texas was quarantined after a clean woman developed the signs and symptoms of the hantavirus infection. And one final note. Pre-planning may be one of the biggest proactive steps a fire department can do in protecting its members and the public. Whenever crews observe hoarding conditions in their day-to-day -day encounters with the public, an effort should be made to enter a premise alert for the address in question. This will help dispatchers alert crews responding to future emergencies at the address that hoarding conditions exist and certain precautions will be necessary. One possibility might be to utilize a scale that the International OCD Foundation uses to rate the severity of hoarding conditions, since the severity can be rather subjective. The scale shows pictures of various rooms with varying degrees of clutter, rated from 1 to 9, with 9 being the worst. The use of such a scale would be dependent on the needs and characteristics of each jurisdiction, but it represents a beginning at trying to quantify the severity of the hoarding conditions present. Kelly 131 is on scene. 